we go down, and then we get to zero again, and then positive derivative. So we're having a switch, right? Positive to negative to positive. That brings us to the first derivative test. That's the name of this test. It's called the first derivative test. And I, th this section I think is very intuitive. I, most people have no issues with this concept. All right, look at what it says. Suppose c is a critical number of a function. So what does it mean for c to be a critical number? It means what's happening? A critical number is anywhere where the derivative is zero or the derivative doesn't exist. All right? So let's say that I'm giving you a point C on a graph, all right? And what I'm telling you is that at this C we have a critical number. So right here, at that point on the graph, either the either the derivative is zero, you either have a flat tangent line or the derivative doesn't exist, which would mean you have, what would, what would be? Okay, so cusp, right? Or vertical tangent line. But we wouldn't have, if we had it, well, we could have vertical asymptote there as well, right? But then the function wouldn't even be defined there. And remember, to be a critical number, to be a critical number, the critical number has to be in the domain of the original function. So if you had an asymptote here, C would not be in the domain of the original function, therefore it could not be a critical number. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Also, you couldn't have a hole here because if there was a hole, then the function wouldn't be defined there, and then again, C couldn't be a critical number. So I know for sure that this is either flat tangent line, cusp, or vertical tangent. When I say vertical tangent, I mean something like this. A graph that would do that, where the tangent line goes like this, and then whoop, just for an instant becomes a vertical line and then curves back over. So at that point, it's either that, we either have that tangent line that's doing this, or we have a tangent line that's doing this, or we have a cusp like that or a corner, right? That would be a critical number at this point. So this, th this, this test says, hey, let's say that that's happening, okay? Let's say we have a critical number at C. Then I tell you, that the first derivative changes from positive to negative at C. That means I tell you that if you go to the left side of this, I can tell you that the derivative over here is positive, and then on this side, I tell you that the derivative is negative, right? So it switches from a positive number to a negative number on the derivative. What would that mean? The graph goes up and then comes down, and therefore you would have to have a local maximum. That would have to be a hilltop. Or it could also be, so let me draw, draw a picture. Do you all agree that, that that would represent what's happening there? To the left, my derivative is positive. To the right, my derivative is negative. How about this? Is that a local maximum? No. It's the highest point, right? Like in that little area, it's the highest point. Yes. Is the derivative positive on the left? It is. is it negative on the right? Yes. It is. yes. But it's not continuous, right? This is continuous. I can draw it without picking up my pencil, no, no. right? Not the, yeah. the, the, the difference between these two is here, the derivative is what? At C, the derivative is what? Zero. So the derivative here at C is zero. What's the derivative here at C? It doesn't exist, right? But that's what it means to be a critical number. Either the derivative is zero or the derivative doesn't exist. What this test says is that if we have a critical number and the derivative to the left is positive and derivative to the right is negative, then our function must go up and down, up and down, which means we're looking at a local maximum. Yes? Yes. Now, on the other hand, let's say we have a critical number and our derivative changes from negative to positive then we're going to have to be at a local minimum, right? That would be this scenario. <clears throat> so I'll do both of them. So let's say I have a point here, C, and I tell you that the derivative over here is negative and the derivative over here is positive. And I tell you here 
let's say the derivative is zero. Okay, so I tell you at C, the derivative is zero. Then it's gonna look like this, right? Negative derivative to the left, positive derivative to the right, derivative is zero at that point. That's the local minimum. I could also do it with a corner or a cusp. I could go like this. Same scenario, right? Except that here at C, the derivative doesn't exist. To the left, the derivative is negative. To the right, positive, yeah? So here, the derivative doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Over here, the derivative is negative. And here, the derivative is positive. The title of the section is The Derivative in the Shapes of Graphs. We're using the derivative and what we know about the derivative, right, to determine where we can find highest and lowest points on a graph. Local, local highest and point, local highest and lowest points. Now, the third case says, if the derivative does not change signs at C, then you do not have a maximum and you do not have a minimum. So let me give you an example of that. Let me erase this one. <clears throat> so let's say we have a critical number, okay? I'm gonna draw you at C. I'm gonna tell you I have a critical number. And just for a first example, let's say that at that, the derivative is zero. So at this point, I have a flat tangent line. But the derivative doesn't change. From, on the left side, it's gonna be positive, on the right, positive. Something like that. You'll see that to the left of this point, my derivative is positive. I get to this point, my derivative is zero, just for an instant, right? Just at that point, it's zero. And then when I go to the right, it stays positive derivative. That's not a local max, that's not a local min, right? That's what that step three is, or part three is saying. Questions? We could do it the other way as well, right? We could do this. That would also, here the derivative is negative on both sides. Can we do it with a does not exist? Can, I, can someone think of what it would look like if I said at C, we had a derivative at C that didn't exist. Can you give me a picture where, where let's say positive derivative, positive derivative? It's a name, but it goes like that. Yeah, that's the vertical tangent, right? The vertical tangent line, it goes like this. Like that, and then like this. Do y'all see that to the left, the derivative is positive? Um, not quite. This is like the inverse tangent function. The x cubed looks more like this. Like, like actually looks more like this one. Pardon? Like the cube root, right? You could do cube root as well, yeah. Cube root of x. So do you all see this? To the left, the derivative is positive. To the right, the derivative is still positive. And at c, the derivative is, well, vertical, right? So it's, it doesn't exist. It's undefined. All right. Pretty, pretty uh, nice little note, right? It's like a little test. It helps us figure out the hills and valleys on a function which is useful if you don't have a closed interval. See, when we have a closed interval, we, we do what we did in 4.1. On the problem we just did, right, the, optim, the fiber optic, if we have a function on a closed interval, we already know how to find the highest and lowest points. But if our function is defined everywhere, all we can ever hope to do is find hills and valleys. And this is what's gonna allow us to do that. You know with me? Okay, so that's the first, so here, I, this is just a visual to show you, look at, um, we already talked about this the other, the other day, that point right there would be a local maximum, right? The point on the bottom here would be a local minimum. So I'm gonna start moving this thing around and watch. We have positive derivative, switches to negative, and then here, look, the derivative goes to zero, right there, and then it stays negative, and then it switches to positive. So I've shown you in color, right? I've, I've kind of 
colored the graph to show you where the derivative is positive, negative, and positive. Yes? Here? Yeah. Like, wouldn't it be a vertical tangent? Well, I guess horizontal, never mind. It's horizontal, yeah. right? Now, I could have drawn a picture that looked more like that, but just this is the example I have. Okay, so you know, it only applies when it's vertical. What only applies? Like, the, like when it's zero. Yeah, I was just trying to give you an example of a function where at, at C, you do have a critical number because the derivative doesn't exist, but you don't have a local max or a local min. You have something where it's the derivative is positive, stays positive, and that's what it would look like. Yeah. So do you all see what the red and green mean here? Yes? Okay. So we switch from positive to negative, right? We have a local max. Here, we switch from negative, well, we don't switch, right? Negative and negative. So there's nothing happening, no locals here. But here we go negative to positive. So we should see a local minimum there. It was only decreasing in the region that was red. No, I thought it was the tangent line. Oh, this piece? Yeah. yeah. Let me get it out of there. Okay, here's another example. Oh, no, this is me just explaining what the pieces are. Okay. All right. I think that's good. Let's get into s some examples here, all right? And then we'll... I think I'm going to... I think I'm going to turn this off and shut this thing. Lights are going to come on brighter here. There we go. All right. I want to leave that up over there. We'll start off, we'll start off uh, with something uh, pretty, pretty clean. <clears throat> so as an example here, I want us to find any local maximums and local minimums. Actually, you know what? Let's make that part B. Part A, find where this function f is increasing and then where f is decreasing. All right, here's the function. f of x equals x cubed uh, minus 6x squared. Start off with a nice, clean polynomial. What I'd like to know is where this graph goes up and where it goes down. Okay? That's the first question. You need to tell me on what inter intervals on the x-axis do I have the graph going up and down. And then after that, I want you to identify any local maximums and any local minimums. So the first thing I'm going to do, right, is find the critical numbers. So I'm going to find the critical numbers by taking the derivative first. 3x squared minus 12x, right? There's my derivative. And so for the critical numbers, I'm going to do the derivative equal to 0, and then I'm going to figure out where the derivative doesn't exist. This seems to be a common theme so far in this chapter, huh? All right, so where is the derivative 0? Well, take 3x squared minus 12x, set it equal to 0. We can pull a 3x out, be left with x minus 4, right? And then set those both equal to 0. We have two solutions, 0 and 4. We good? OK, does the derivative ever not exist? Why? Yeah, the derivative is just a, a polynomial, a quadratic function. I can plug any number I want into this. So one way to look at this 
is really saying, is there a domain issue for the derivative? And there's not. So I can ignore that. <clears throat> now, to figure out where this function's going up and down, I'm going to use these to figure it out. Right? So here's where we do something different than we, ha than we have ever done before. The next step is to draw a number line. And I want to label these points on the number line, 0 and 4. Now I know, I know that at 0, my derivative, is, my derivative is 0, right? And I know at 4, my derivative is 0. So I know I have flat tangent lines there, right? What I need to figure out is whether or not my graph's like coming up like that and going down, or is it going down and then going up, right? We need to figure all that out. So what this number line does is it, it creates like a natural, and keep in mind, I'm not graphing the function right here. I'm just, this is a visual kind of like me putting ideas together. But these two numbers create kind of a natural partition or breakup of the number line. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask myself, over here to the left, is my graph going up or down? right? And then between 0 and 4 is my graph, is it going up or is it going down? And then to the right of 4 is my graph going up or is it going down? Understand? So to figure out if it's going up or down, I'm going to just need to look at the derivative, right? What is the derivative doing in each of those three regions? So what I'm going to do is pick what are called test points. I'm going to pick a point over here. I'm not going to put a dot, I'm just going to put a little x. And I'm going to pick any number I want to the left of 0. So negative 1. I'm going to pick any number I want between here and here. How about 2? And then any number I want over here, I can do 5, 6, 7, I can do a million, doesn't matter. I'm just going to do 5, right? And what I'm going to do with those numbers is I'm going to plug them into the derivative and figure out if I get a positive answer or a negative answer. Does that make sense? So if I plug negative 1, these test points, test points are going to go into the derivative. <clears throat> test points go into the derivative. So I go negative 1 into the derivative. So what happens if you plug negative 1 into the derivative? Well, here's a derivative, right? Not this, this, right? So plug negative 1 in here and what do you get? I get a positive number. Do you all see it's a positive? And we could actually figure out what the number is. And that would give us the slope of the tangent line right there. But all I care about is that it's positive. Okay? This is a positive number. Right? Which means the derivative over here, right? The derivative over here in this region is greater than zero. Right? So if the derivative over here is greater than zero, then what can you tell me about the function over here? What is it doing? It's going up. So the way I do that is I just draw a little arrow like that. Okay, pay attention to, to the notation here. I'm saying the derivative here is positive, which means that the function's going up, right? And I'm gonna do the same thing at two, and then the same thing at five, and then I should get some like general picture of what, what's going on. All right, so when we plug in two, what happens at two? Into the derivative, so you 2 squared, 4 times 3 is 12. You get a negative number, don't you? And that's less than 0, right? So my derivative is less than 0. So over here, my derivative is less than 0, right? Which means my original function is going down, right? A negative derivative means the function goes down. And then I plug in 5. And guess what you're going to get? Positive, right? Greater than 0. So my derivative here is greater than 0, which means my original function here is going up. Now, just be warned that when you do this, you cannot just do the first one and just assume that the rest are just going to switch each time. That doesn't happen all the time. It happens a lot, but it doesn't happen all the time. So you have to check each one. If, if that's what it did, that's, then I would tell you, just find the first one, then all the others switch, if that's what it actually did. But it doesn't, all right? Every function's a little bit different. Okay, good? Questions? Let's try and answer part A. Do we know where the function's going up and down from that picture? Yes. Okay, so when we do it, we're gonna treat it like 
I'm going to say, I'm going to write like this. F is increasing. Okay, from now on, that arrow up like that next to F means increasing. So my function is increasing where? We're going to do it like a domain. So where is the graph going up? To the left of zero, right? Forever. And then to the right of four. Okay, so I'm going to write that this way. Negative infinity to zero, union four to infinity. Now, does that interval notation make sense? Yes. Now, I do not have to include zero. When any, anytime you're talking about up and down, you do not have to have the endpoints. You can leave them off. In this case, it would be okay to put a bracket on the zero and it would be okay to put a four. It would not be wrong. But if for some reason um, this critical number, there, there's going to be some problems later where this number is like where we have an asymptote. Even though it's not a critical number, it's an asymptote and so we can't include that point. So it's dangerous to include it. So I tell my students just always put parentheses on your intervals when you're doing increasing and decreasing because it's not wrong to not include the point. All right, where is it decreasing? Zero to four. Boom, done. Okay, so we've answered part A. We know where the function's going up, where it's going down. All right, part B is to find any local maximums and local, or local minimums, right? All right, so let's take a look. A local, I'm gonna put L max. Do we have any local maximums? Yes, how are you, how can you tell we have a local maximum? shape of the graph, right? It goes up and then it goes down, right? So at this point zero, we should have a local max, right? As long as zero is in the domain of the original function, as long as our function is defined here, is it? Yeah, I mean, it's a polynomial, right? So let's plug zero into that. So we have a local max. I'm going to write it as a point at zero. And then what happens? So if this is kind of where math sucks. These are intervals, right? And uh, here I'm listing a point. So this is an actual point. So zero goes in, right? And what comes out? I'm plugging that number to the original function, right? To figure out that point on the graph. You get zero. So zero, zero is a local maximum. Do I have any local minimums? Where? Four. So I plug in four and now plug four into the graph or four into the original function, 64 yeah, minus, minus 16. what is it come out to be? Is it negative 32? I'm about to verify it with the graph. So I'm going back to Desmos. I'm going to go back to the standard graph here. I'm going to graph x cubed minus 6x squared. There's the graph. I'm going to kind of shift this axis so we can see it there. There we go. All right, does it look like we did right here? Is our graph going up to the left of zero? Is it going up from four to the right? Yes? Is it decreasing between zero and four? All right. And do we have a local maximum at 0, 0? Yeah. And a local minimum at 4, negative 32? Yeah. Right? I can hover over that point to verify. There we go, 4, negative 32. We have a pretty good idea of what that graph looks like now, right? Without, without seeing it there, using calculus, we have a, a way of, of, of drawing that better, right? Yes. You only need one test point. Once you find your critical numbers, you only need one test point in between. Okay, so it's always going to be that way. Yes, because we are, we are assuming that this derivative never, it's always positive over here, that it would never be negative, because this is a good point. All right, good. I, I kind of always like, skirt around this question because no one ever asks it. The reason we know. Let's look in here. The reason we know that this, is, this derivative is always negative between here and here is because if the deriv derivative ever became positive in here, 
then it would have to go through zero again, wouldn't it? Like it would have to go from negative to positive, so it would have to go through zero, which means I would have had another critical number, right? So this, we can be sure that between these two critical numbers, whatever the derivative is doing, it's doing everywhere in here. So we only need one test point. Good question. Yes? This is uh, getting ahead, but um, so later when we take the second derivative, will that eliminate the need to have test points? Nope, we still need them. Oh, well, there's a second derivative test, but it requires that the first derivative is equal to zero. It, doesn't, it can't handle when the derivative doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, we need to talk about the second derivative and the second derivative test and all that, but we need to make sure we understand this first. Okay, this next one I want to show you I think is pretty cool. <coughs> All right. <clears throat> I want you to go back for a second to college algebra. All right. And I want you to see if you remember this. In college algebra, when you were studying quadratic functions, the generic, most general form of a quadratic function was ax squared plus bx plus c. Right? That's the most generic form of a quadratic function. And you're taught in, in college algebra that when you graph these, they look like these parabolas, right? They either open up or they open down, right? Up or down. And that A, the number in front of x squared, is what dictates what happens here, right? If A is positive, this is what happens. If A is negative, this is what happens. Yes? And then you're taught, oh, but you know, all parabolas have this very, imp <laughs> very important point right there. Right? They have an important point on the parabola, which we call the vertex. vertex right? So this point is called the vertex. And in college algebra, you were told that we can find the vertex. And there's a couple of ways. You can complete the square on this, or there's a formula that they give you as well. And so they tell you that this vertex is the point h, k. Does that look familiar? h, k. And they tell you in college algebra how you can figure out what h is. They say h will always be negative b divided by 2a. Does that look familiar to you from college algebra? Yeah, does that look familiar? So, so look, what they're telling you is that if you, graph, if you graph a parabola, let's just say it opens up, and you want to find this lowest point, this h value, right, that right there, that's the h, the k is the up and down. But you can find the h by just doing that, right? OK, so where does this come from? Well, it comes from what we're doing right now. Because what if I asked you to find where a function is in increasing and decreasing, right, and finding the local max and mins, but the function I give you is a generic quadratic function? So remember here, a is just a number. Like that could be 4x squared plus 3 times x plus 9, right? So just imagine those are constants. To do the first step, I take the derivative, right? So what's the derivative of this? A so the 2 has to come out, right? 2 has to come out and hit the a. So 2a, 2ax, everyone got that? 2ax plus b. And then derivative of a constant is 0. So that's my derivative, right? Now I need the critical number, so what do I do with this? Set it equal to zero, right? So take my derivative, set it equal to zero. So take 2ax plus b, set it equal to zero, and then take, where does the derivative not exist? Well, this will never happen, right? Because this is, this is a line. This is a linear function. So that I don't need to worry about. But here, what do I do to solve for x? Move b over, and then divide both sides by 2a. And there you have it, negative b over 2a, right? That is where I have something critical happening. So I come over here on a number line, I put negative b, uh, no, negative b, that's negative 2. I don't know what this number is, right? I'm just doing this like in general, but I know that I would put that critical number on the number line. That would break my number line up into two regions, and I would pick test points, right? 
And what's going to happen, depending on the parabola, and it, it all depends on A, it's either going to go down here and up, or it could go up and down, up then down. One of those two scenarios is going to happen. But this will either be a local min or a local max, which will be the, what the vertex is, right? So I, I just wanted to show you that that's where this formula comes from, right? It comes from, the, it's just the critical number of the parabola. That's all it is. Y'all don't look too, too impressed. Okay, we move on. It's, whenever I'm in teaching college algebra, I always tell them that that formula is a gift from calculus, right? We get to use it in college algebra. It's a gift. In, in Cal 1, you can maybe see where it comes from. All right. <clears throat> Let's do something harder. No one has the book with them, right? Forgot my book today. I'm going to put the problems up here on the board and then or on the projector there and then you can you can tell me which one you want me to to do. Chapter 4, 4.3, exercises. Let me just look at a couple of these. That's really hard for you to see, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to make the first, first two off limits there. So how about out of those, if you can see those? x over x squared plus 1, sine x plus cosine. So how about either 4 or 7? What would you all rather see right now? 4 or 7? Seven? Seven. You want to see 7? Okay. So what if we have f of x equals e to the 2x plus e to the negative x. And I want to know where this function is increasing and decreasing. I want to know anywhere it has a local max and a lo or a local min. All right? Well, first thing I need is the derivative, right? OK, for the derivative, what's a derivative? We can do them separately, right, because we have plus. What's derivative e to the 2x? e to the 2x? E to 2x? times 2, right? Times 2, because chain rule. So 2e to the 2x is that. And then plus, well, is it going to be a plus? It's going to be a minus, right? Derivative e to the negative x, x is itself, but then times the derivative.